Okay. We're here this time, and it's definitely going to work. We did a lot of double and triple checking. <laughs> I want to apologize for everybody who showed up last week. My Verizon Wi-Fi went out, and they had to go up on the roof and fix something. So I tried to do this from home. It wasn't working. People are telling me YouTube was crashing at the same time. The whole thing was a shit show, so I just hit the ripcord because why, you know, why give you guys something that's not technically immaculate? Right, Mike? Right. We're, aren't, aren't we all about quality? I hope so. Duncan was completely ashamed of himself. He uh, committed seppuku like a samurai who's disgraced his master. Um, so the whole thing was shameful for all of us. But we're going to come back even stronger this time. And hopefully you guys like what we do this week. Uh, Pied Piper, we Pied Piper fixed the issue for us. <laughs> we're using Pied Piper compression. Um, before we get started, let's see who's in the house tonight. Simon Coop is here. Tim Brown is here. He's already calling the show a shit show. Thank you. We appreciate it. Francisco's in the house. Roger Weatherford. Jeff Cox is here. Cox, don't worry. We're going to get it done tonight. What's up to my man Ian Dunlop? we got a lot of people here tonight. I'm pretty excited. Uh, before we even go any further, make sure you hit that like button if you haven't already. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. We come back every Tuesday at 530 for the most part. All right. Um, let's do the Y Charts thing. Shout to Y Charts, our sponsor. Duncan, hit the tile. See that? It's technology. All right. So now that I'm done apologizing, oh my God, record earnings for the S&P 500, like maybe the biggest upside surprise quarter in American history. And all stocks want to seem to do is go down. So I know you did a really good blog post about this, but I want to, I want to start with this. And this is from uh, Bookbinder over at LPL, who does really good work. He's their chief equity strategist or something. Quote, to call this earnings season a blowout, Duncan, throw that chart up, uh, would be an understatement. We wrote in our earnings preview that the combination of strengthening economic growth Booming manufacturing, rising estimates, positive guidance could potentially lead to double-digit upside, which implied earnings growth of about 35%, uh, with nearly 90% of S&P 500 constituents having reported S&P 500 earnings growth is tracking to a 49% year-over-year increase. So first of all, did you ever think you'd see anything like that before? A 50% uh, earnings growth quarter-over-quarter? No, I I was talking to Morgan or early Morgan Housel early in the pandemic, and we were talking about how a lot of the earnings that we were going to see are going to look like typos, right? When you see like negative eighty percent economic data too. Yeah. Now we're on now we're on the other side of that. Yeah, and it's I guess it's still shocking to see, but the market is not surprised at all. In fact, the but market is selling off on the best earnings reports. You know what's really weird? All what of the analysts are behind the estimates. Estimates are knocking it out of the park, um, but the market is still selling off, which is interesting. So the market already discounted this, even though the analysts were behind. Uh, General Motors was supposed to report a dollar six for Q1. Well, yeah, they reported like two and a quarter. How's the and stock the, doing? The stock went up like a dollar from that. So. I don't think anyone's paying any attention to these estimates anymore, I guess is the only way I could. How, how could you have a 100% upside quarter and the market yawn? Um, yeah. it's, happening, it's, happening, it's happening in every name. Let me do this real quick, and then I want to yeah. go to your, your blog on this subject. Um, so speaking of the analysts not catching up, here's more from Bookbinder. After three quarters of huge upside surprises, the second, third, and fourth quarters of 2020, we expect an analyst to catch up. Clearly, they haven't. Because the 13 percentage points of upside to fourth quarter earnings is being followed by a 23 percentage point upside so far in the first quarter of 2021. Keep in mind, the average upside going back to 2010 is 6%. That 23 points is enormous, end quote. Yeah. So even like these magnitudes of, of beats, the like analysts are still running behind. They haven't figured it out yet. And... They're, they've just not gotten ahead of it. And maybe that's still a good thing for the next quarter we go into. I think maybe we have to zoom out because stocks have been on such a monstrous run that with the benefit of hindsight, now we know what was priced in and what was priced in were these monster gains. So I did this chart showing that the stocks that are getting hit hardest right now 
were the biggest winners from 2020. So Tesla gained what, like 700 something percent in 2020 and phase are we, energy. Are we popping that? Do we yeah, know which, does Duncan know which one that is? Yeah, it's, it's the bubble chart, chart the okay. chart with all the bubbles. So we spoke about end phase energy last year, I think. So the biggest winners are just getting clocked right now. Teladoc, Trade Desk. And actually, it seems like this morning in the pre-market, we got some capitulation. What do you think? So some of these stocks have gone down so much that today there were just no sellers left and they started turning green pretty early. So there's some um, cr there's some crazy reversals this morning that I I don't want to step on I want to get to later but let's just talk about let's just talk about the art complex. Uh, Eric Balchunas did this wild thing showing that 55 percent of the money that came into Arc are now underwater. So 55 percent of the money came in after November 2020. Wait, can we just all, can, yeah, we, hold, can we hold it right there? Please think about psychologically what that does to the individual stocks, not, not to, uh, mechanically. Think about what that does to the individual stocks in her portfolios. Like you have trapped longs who can't wait to get back to even. No, hold which, on. That was just, you don't think that, so? No, that was just the shot. The chaser okay. is that despite 55% of the assets being underwater, only 1% have exited on a net basis. So I did a chart, uh, uh, a post recently showing that they're not leaving. No, I wouldn't leave either. If you if you bought this ETF because you believe in her, which there's no other reason to buy it, nothing about what she's saying or doing has changed. The sentiment around some of these stocks has changed, but I wouldn't I wouldn't like abandon uh, a manager just because they're in an out of favor strategy unless yeah, you think. But, 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 Josh, the market's at an all-time high, and these things are down. This thing is down 30%. That's tough. Her part of the market is not at an all-time high. Dude, the market is at an all-time high. And if you bought this, you're down 30% potentially. That's, that's, she, that's rough. But, uh, I, all right. I'm agreeing it's rough. I guess my point is she's not saying um, that she's running a strategy that does well in any, in any environment. Her strategy does well when people are excited about the future. Yeah, right I think, now, I think, they're excited about locomotives. What do you want her to do? Switch her holdings? No, I think we're talking past each other. This is not about her. It's about the investors. And I'm sort of mm. giving I'm giving credit to investors that came in and they're not running at the first, they're not panicking at panicking at the first sign of disappointment. So good for them. Yo, if she goes down 50%, I might buy some. You 50 you might at 50 you might see a rush for the exits. 50, I know, but that's when that's when I get interested. Like 50% because it, Listen, there are no natural buyers for her names other than herself. Like the value investors are not coming into genomic stocks. I don't mm -hmm. care if they're down 80%. They have no cash flow. They have no earnings. So somebody has to come in, and maybe that'll be me. I don't think I could save, I don't think I could save the ETF, uh, but that's where I would get excited to see a drawdown of like half. Right? I will Lose half the gains from the high. Yeah, yeah. We'll, right. come back to the, we'll come back to this, but let's move on for a second. So I want to talk okay. to you about about business media. This this shocked the hell out of me. Um, I don't think you're going to be surprised, but I was. During the third quarter, Dow Jones saw the highest year over year increase in total subscriptions. Um, the Wall Street Journal grew twenty one percent year over year to a record three point three eight million average subscriptions. That sounds like a tiny, tiny number. Mike, those numbers suck. I was going to say, and I love the Wall Street Journal. I'm a lifelong subscriber. That sounds it's tiny. WSJ right? and Barron's, those numbers are tiny. Think about it. They said 40 million new brokerage accounts opened last year. So the Dow Jones captured less than a tenth of those as subscribers or less well, than. Why, why read a newspaper when you can go on FinTalk? But, but, but this is a record. 3.38 million is a record. That's a, just a shockingly tiny number. Well, it's not a record of people who read their content. It's a record of people who are actually paying for it. Yeah, because there's, there's yeah. ad supported that's free, and then there's subscription. And, and while we're while we're on the topic, I'm I'm sneaking in a two for one here. Um, while we're on the topic of business media, I want to talk for a second about Drucker Miller. Today on the show, today on CNBC, he was talking with uh, with Joe Kernan. He said, "I can't find any period in history where monetary and fiscal policy were this out of step with the economic circumstances." So, what does he mean by out of step? Like they keep stimulating, and the economy's overheating. Meaning, meaning so. He said that he supported what what the Fed and Congress did, but those position those the situation is no longer dire and they're still pumping. I agree with him, and I'm not nobody. The Fed should not listen to me. 
I don't think it's justified. I don't think there's any justification for the Fed buying eighty billion dollars a month in Treasuries and forty billion a month in mortgage bonds. I don't understand how that gives anyone a job that hasn't gotten one already. The people that have not been back to work yet are people who are literally caring for a kid at home who's doing school remotely or work in an industry that can't be back at full capacity. Like that is most of the reason we're still at six percent unemployment. The Fed could buy a hundred trillion dollars worth of mortgage bonds. It would not change that. So I, I really think that uh, I really think that Druck's point is an important point. I don't I don't think it's not something though that Fed governors haven't considered already. Like, do you think they're not looking at the same data he is? Yeah, of course. And, and listen, this is this is I don't want to say a shtick. That sounds disrespectful. But here's a quote from himself. He said, "I have baritis." Because I made all my highest absolute returns in bear markets. One of his best trades was was shorting the pound. My right. average returns in bear markets was well over 50%. So he already knows that this is his bias. But Modest Proposal uh, tweeted something really intelligent. He said, Druckenmiller is one of the best money makers of all time, partly because his own forecasts are irrelevant to his own investing. I feel like that's like a one of one. Nobody could have an opinion and completely have it not influence their investing. Like his portfolio definitely doesn't match what he's saying. If you have never read anything about Druckenmiller and you only know him through his reputation. You, you think he's a perma bear? You think A, he's always bearish. B, you think he's wrong half the time. And he has been but, saying this stuff about the Fed for a decade, in fairness. Well, by the way, in January, him and Tepper were on CNBC telling Squawk Box how bullish they were last year. Then the world blew up. <laughs> oh, oh, I was about to say, he said this is the worst risk reward I've ever seen uh, after the bounce, after the bounce. So in like April, he said that. Right, but I'm saying before the pandemic came along. By shout to Tibbs. Yeah, couldn't find a reason not to be bullish. Then the pandemic comes, and then he's like not bullish on the recovery. It was one of the best opportunities to buy stocks ever. He said it was the worst, one of the worst risk rewards he's ever seen. And by the way, I bet you he's done okay over the past year. So again, sure. it's, it's always a case. Don't worry about what they say, especially Drucken Miller, who could change his mind in a second. Well, he's right. So his, his like best trades are based on thinking one thing the next day, like their back hurts. Wasn't he levered think, long going, going into October, 1987 and then flipped short, uh, either the morning of or something like that. Yeah. He did the same thing with the dot com thing. Like he was out. And then it kept running, and then he flipped and got all in, and then the next day got all out again. Well, Nobody he blew can... up it. Yeah, he did, he did it just so well in 99. He went all in on tech at the top. But well, Right, but then flipped it and went all in short. Like, nobody can really do that in real life, so that stuff is not helpful for most people. Although, I think he's right in this case. Uh, I don't really understand the rationale behind stimulus as far as the eye can see. I really think that it would actually be encouraging if they started talking about pulling back some stimulus because things are going well, but I guess they don't see it that way. And who, who you know, who, who the fuck am I? All right. Uh, I want to get to cryptocurrency regulation. I, I made a promise that we weren't going to do a, you know, 40 minutes on crypto tonight. Um, I who just did you think promise? wait, who did you, who did you promise myself? Like in my, inside of my own soul, oh, okay. like I so said, I didn't, I didn't Josh, get the Josh, don't do 40 minutes on Dogecoin and Bitcoin tonight, but I think this is important. Uh, it's obvious now that the powers that be within crypto understand that the on-ramps are all going to be regulated and there's just no way around it. So they're starting to, you're starting to see the, the wheels turning and they're starting to buy politicians, which is what they should do at this so, stage. So, so this, this article was all about, about lobbyists. Yeah. Because I, I thought this was interesting. There's a quote from a lawyer. Right now, it's like the wild, wild west, and you have different federal agencies fighting over which one is jurisdiction. Yes. So the reason you don't have a crypto ETF yet is because the regulators have not yet convinced Congress, the existing securities regulators have not yet convinced Congress to pass a bill giving them oversight of the players that interact with the public. And that will happen. I don't think there should be any doubt that the Financial Services Committee um, will be engaged in this kind of activity, and ultimately, either the CFTC or the or, or uh, the SEC or both are going to get jurisdiction over the brokerages, over the exchanges, and the IRS is going to be way more involved than they are as well. And until that happens, I don't think you're getting an ETF here. I, let me, I mean, what let, do you think let, about that take? Well, I want to turn the take, and I want to ask your take on something. 
Uh, so Janet Yellen, who's not that she has any oversight in this, but obviously she's a very important person. She said it is a highly speculative asset, and I think people should be beware. It can be extremely volatile, and I do worry about potential losses that investors in it could suffer. How is that relevant? First of all, does anybody not know that it's volatile? Come on, it's twenty twenty one. Uh, the only two, reason people what, are in it is because it's volatile. Right, that's that's the whole point. What about and what about triple levered inverse ETFs? Or any of the uh, pennies? I mean, that's such a nonsensical argument. Her, it's not an argument for or against anything either. She's actually not saying anything. I don't think that's important to pay attention to. Um, I, I would argue trading soybeans or hog bellies. That's every bit as potentially volatile and ruinous if you don't know but what so, you're doing. So right now, they don't know how to classify it. Is it, is it a security? Uh, is it a commodity? It's not is a it security. A, is it a currency? It's not a security, but if 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 they give permission to Van Eck to launch a, an ETF based on Bitcoin, then that that is a security. Well, but Duncan, that's throw not the, the, Duncan, throw this chart up. How many fi how many uh, potential filings have there been? It looks like fifteen. Winklevoss was the first in two thousand thirteen, and across the board, rejected, rejected, rejected. So Balchunas was writing about this. He said that Canada um, has two point three billion dollars in crypto ETFs in only that three doesn't months. Doesn't sound like a lot. Well, but, but, but their their market is one twenty seventh the size of ours. So if you normalize it, that's like sixty billion dollars here. So that's pretty that big. Be, that would be impressive. It would still be smaller than Coinbase, though, and I feel like it should be larger. Like, wouldn't it be weird if there was a publicly traded gold miner that was bigger than the assets in GLD? That would be weird to me, right? So if there is a GLD for Bitcoin, I feel like it should be bigger than Coinbase. As a public company, why yeah, would I be wrong but, with but, that? But, but the thing is, GLD unlocked investing in gold for the everyday person. People are already invested in Bitcoin. They're already doing that's, it through GB. That's not through an G argument. That's not an argument. People were buying gold miners in the public markets yeah, to get access to Yeah, but it's an argument against why should GDBX be bigger than G GLD. No, GDX shouldn't be. Right. I'm uh, saying. I, I think if there's a GLD of Bitcoin, it should be bigger than any of the publicly traded crypto companies. I don't think that's controversial. Anyway, one last chart I want to throw up. Uh, uh, this is from Bianco. Digital currencies surpass paper currencies. This is a wild one. What does that even mean? What? This is total. This is total currency fiat in circulation. How much? How much total paper currency is in circulation? Looks like what is that? About two trillion. Two point one trillion. Well, oh, so like literal, like physical dollars. Physical dollars. Uh, what do you think? So, what is it? What does this say to you when you see this comparison? Uh, I don't know. I guess just wow. Doesn't this doesn't doesn't a picture say a thousand words? Well, what, what else? Get, what else could you add? Given how few things are actually purchased with cash these days, it's not as big of a wow to me. I I'd love to see that versus all currencies outstanding like paper and otherwise. Uh, I think it's I think it's not even close to as well, impressive. Yeah, no, no. Then, then, uh, then, it's, then, it's, then it's a drop in the bucket. All right, where are we going next? Oh, we're going to stick with this tangentially. Matt O'Brien, Obsolete Dogma, tweeted, the fact that a joke pyramid scheme, meaning Dogecoin, this is such a great tweet, now has a bigger market cap than one of the companies that's used its revolutionary new technology to develop a COVID vaccine in record time and is now working on applying that to other diseases probably means Eugene Fama should lose his Nobel. Your thoughts? Can you picture Eugene Fama reading that tweet to himself and just going, ha! <laughs> <laughs> Remember his laugh? <laughs> Remember we heard him laughing? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so he, would get a kick. he would get a kick out of this. Respond. Well, I know that Matt is joking also, but I don't think Eugene Fama suggests that the price is always right for everything at all times. Like that's not what efficient markets actually means. I, th I think right now people are pricing in a future where Elon Musk makes Doge go higher. So you could argue it's very efficiently priced. Like the majority of people involved in this stupid piece of computer code think it's going up. Like it, it doesn't have to be any it doesn't have to be any more uh, sophisticated than that, does it? No. So two, I want to. So I have two two things. Uh, Matt Levine was writing today. So the the crypto is definitely still the wild west. It is still so immature. For a few minutes during trading on Wednesday, for example, the price of Ethereum Classic jumped well above a hundred dollars on the Coinbase exchange. The digital token was trading at less than eighty dollars at other venues. 
That's a pretty widespread. Don't you understand that nobody buying it even knows what that is? Do you know how many texts I've gotten from people? Should I buy Ethereum or Ethereum Classic? And then I try to explain that six years ago there was a hack and the community voted to do a fork, but not everybody agreed. I do that on a a text message. I'm like, wait, what the fuck am I talking about? I'm just repeating a fairy tale that somebody else told me that has no meaning. And when you see moves in these coins, the idea that the people actually doing the buying and selling have any idea what's going on, like you should – I have learned to check myself, and then I just realize, oh, it's literally flip a coin like betting. It's gambling based on nothing, whatever they whatever they saw on TikTok, and so, then you so, don't get as mad. What? Then you don't get as uh-huh. angry when you so when I, you realize that. So I I think markets are still very efficient in the sense that obviously price is not always right at every second of the day, um, but good luck knowing when it's right, when it's wrong. Here's a good example. This morning, Jamia, which is an African, they're not based in Africa, but it's an e-commerce company that does work in Africa. We're going with uh, Jumia on that Jumia. Yeah. Okay, Jumia. Thank you. you got um, it. <laughs> Jumia this morning at 9.30 opened down 23%. For one day? It, the stock opened, they reported earnings. The stock gapped down 23%. You know what it finished the day? It finished the day up 7%. That is a turnaround. It gained 41% off the lows. What happened? Did they announce a Doge position on it, their balance sheet? It gained 41% <laughs> off the lows. So was the price right in the morning or wrong in the morning and right in the afternoon? I don't know. But nobody nobody does. That's the point is that nobody can consistently know whether stocks, whether prices are too high or too low. And that, to me, is the point of efficient markets. The, the way that I've gotten over this this uh, thing with efficient markets are they aren't they I I've no, they come are. to the all right I've come to this understanding that they're not ever at efficiency but they're always trying to get as close as they can and it's like a process it's not a moment well, how about they don't ever millions, reach perfect efficiency millions of people are transacting every second and yeah. you know that everybody else is right or wrong no, you're you're when you're placing a trade, you're not saying someone's right or wrong. You're saying people are going to change their mind and agree with this point of view eventually. Like it's different, it's different than being right or wrong. It's people are going to feel differently about the stock later, right? Bullish or bearish. I think that's that. I think that's a better way to think about uh, efficiency or not. Um, all right, we're not going to solve this today. Did you watch uh, SNL in real time, or did you watch the clips uh, in I want, hindsight? I- no, I was amped. I, I was amped up for it. I watched the first like 12 minutes or so. Okay. I was at my friend's birthday at 110 in, in Melville, just com- completely obliterated. I couldn't even watch it when I got home. Uh, okay. So, But I watched it the next day, I guess, when all the reaction was over with on social media. Um, I Wait, liked you still, him. You still, you still watch SNL, right? Yeah, I, no? I actually watch it. I okay. do. I talked to some of the like people that have been involved in writing it, and I'm into it. Um, did, was he endearing? Did you like I, him better after versus before as a person? How about, how, here, here's my take. When I saw him do his opening monologue, I thought there were a few zingers. I thought he did pretty well, but my reaction was like, oh, I get it now. Because I, I haven't seen a million of his interviews, but he said uh, that he has Asperger's, and you could tell that he was incredibly awkward. Um, uh, and so after seeing him, I have a better appreciation of where he's coming from. He was awkward his whole life and he still is. Yeah. And it's not Incredi- and a lot of it. And a lot of it's not his fault. Yeah. In- incredibly, incredibly awkward. I can't imagine what some of the company meetings are like. Um, but just SNL, man, I, I thought the, I forget what, which segment it was or which sketch it was, but it was just, it was just like, ba- like it made me sad how bad it was. It's not great. It's not, it's not laugh out loud funny, uh, I mean, rarely it uh, any rarely anything is laugh out loud funny, but SNL definitely isn't these days. But hang on, remember like remember what? Well, you were I was younger, you were not so young. But when Will Ferrell was like the star, I was dude, I was young too. When, relax. When, when, I, was, when, when, I was definitely in my twenties then. Okay, <laughs> relax. Him and Sherry, him and Sherry O'Terry, the the yeah. Spartan cheerleaders, like that yeah. was laugh out loud funny. That killed me. Yeah, uh, I can't even. Molly think Shannon. Of I'm not one of these people that like hates Saturday Night Live and says, "Oh, it was wasn't it hasn't been funny since the '70s." I I've always loved the show. Uh, I don't think there's a person right now that consistently makes you laugh. Um, 
anyway, back to Elon. I yeah. thought it was Alpha to bring his mom out. I was like, how do you get mad at this guy once he does that? And I was kind of thinking his mom should jump on Twitter to defend his tweets when like uh, like his mom like should not be like, mom. you don't know Elon. Like, yeah. please, like leave him alone kind of that thing. Would, that, would, that would make him a little bit more endearing. Um, I was listening to Rogan and Chappelle try to figure out why it was that him appearing on Saturday Night Live was controversial in the first place. Like what part of him? Yeah. Like he, people were trying to cancel him and the cast was like mad. For but what? what it, I think because he was cavalier about coronavirus when it first came out and he was tweeting like okay. bullshit about it. But who wasn't? Right. <laughs> Chappelle, Chappelle was like, who wasn't tweeting stupid shit about Corona? Right. Like nobody really knew anything. Um, all right. Anyway, I like him. I like him better now than I did prior to the show. So if that was his point in doing it, uh, well done. Let's talk about tech. Some people think that one of the biggest threats to tech is potential regulation coming down the pipe. Pike? Pike. The pike. Um, <laughs> Duncan, throw what? up the shot. What? What potential regulation? You mean breaking them up? Yeah, yeah. Antitrust. At, yeah, yeah. Look yeah. at, so the market cap of Apple, Microsoft, Amazon Alphabet, Facebook, Tesla is now about a quarter of the index. Yeah. So I, lo I looked at some of the data of what's going on inside of the companies. Now, I'm, I'm not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that Apple is about to spit out iPad or that the government would, <laughs> would break apart <laughs> the products, but, but just look at how big the iPad is. The mm. iPad did more quarterly revenue than freaking McDonald's. And it's not even a hot product. I mean, no, I guess it is right now because I guess it is. Once, I, I, haven't bought, I haven't bought an iPad in, I don't know, eight years. It's bigger than, did more revenue than Philip Morris. Well, they're expensive. The Apple's problem with the iPad historically has been that it's so well made. You don't need to replace it every 18 months like you do with a phone. Which is like a good problem to have as a consumer. We have we have six year old iPads in my house. I'm not getting another one. So I get a new this, phone every year and a half. Right. Okay. So the the iPad is not the point. The next chart is the point. I got Go it. to the next one, Duncan. So Amazon Web Services, for example, which could certainly be a target if they were to get broken up. This would be a standalone company. This thing did more revenue in the last twelve months. Then, uh, well, you see, more than Allstate, more than Caterpillar, more than Pfizer, more than Nike. As more a than standalone company, it would be, yeah, yeah. Just AWS. Gigantic. Okay, so this thing is, so Amazon Web Services is growing 30% a year on the top line. They have 30% operating margins. So if you put a 35 multiple on that, which I think is very reasonable, uh, let's see, Apple's doing 28 times earnings. So let's see, and they're growing much slower. Let's say you slap a 35 multiple on their earnings. That would get you to about half a trillion dollars in market on their, cap. What, what are their earnings? Because the uh, chart is showing I, revenue. So Amazon Web Services. I'm showing yeah, you take their revenue, you do the, the, operating, uh, the operating margins of 30%, gets you to okay. a rough earnings number, you put 35 times on that, gets you to half a trillion dollars. Yeah, I believe it. So, so if, 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 if Instagram was spun out, how much would that be worth? Instagram I'm, I'm, would I guess, be I guess worth I'll, more, than the, more than the parent. Yeah, my point is... You could actually unlock value if you, if you split these things up. Yes. If you're a shareholder in these companies and someone's like, oh, aren't you worried about regulation? I pray for it. Right. I, want, I would rather own standalone Instagram How much than, is YouTube worth? than Facebook. Uh, YouTube would be worth more than all of the existing television networks and maybe almost as much as Netflix. Like, I don't, I don't see how it wouldn't be. If you just look at their advertising revenue and compare it to Netflix's subscription business, and then you say, okay, maybe subscription is worth a little bit more multiple-wise than advertising, I still think it's that massive, that it has to be in that same category of stock. I, I, I also think, though, the idea of like AWS being a problem from an antitrust standpoint, that's a very hard case to make. That market is actually a thriving uh, competitive uh, market. Like Google is fighting tooth and nail. Microsoft's growing massively. Microsoft is bigger than Amazon. And Oracle is not sitting back. Their own uh, cloud subscription business is, is growing very rapidly. And that's what they're devoting like a, a lot of their resources to. So this idea that AWS is anti-competitive. Well, I don't, it, I don't think anybody's saying, I don't think anybody's saying that, but maybe that these companies have just gotten too big. They, they wield too much power. You can make a case.
I would be concerned if there are politicians paying attention to Fortnite versus Apple and looking at the take rate for the App Store and saying that Apple behaves anti-competitively, uh, anti-competitively in the amount of their rake and that that's the next thing that they want to go after. Like that would be if I as an Apple shareholder, that's something that would concern me cuz I don't think there's any benefit to that. That's not like spin off the App Store. That's just make the App Store less. I think that's like uh, an acute threat that so we maybe, should think may, about. So maybe regulation is certainly is a threat. I just don't think breakup, the breakup is, is the threat. It's the wrong threat. The right, right threat is making these companies less profitable versus forcing shareholders to accept spinoffs, which shareholders would love. Um, okay. I think we went through our topics. Duncan's going to pop in and do viewer topics, and we have a couple tonight. What's up, dude? Hey, guys. How's it going? What's going Duncan. on? Rep in Duke University. Yeah, Love yeah, to see yeah. It. yeah. You're either a Carolina fan or a Duke fan if you're from North Carolina, you know. So, Duncan, were you despondent last Tuesday when the technical difficulties forced us to cut the show in half? Yeah, that would be an understatement, probably. Yeah, I was it too, was, man. Yeah, I was, was very rough. sad. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, we're we're here tonight, and we have a good audience. I see 1,170 people, so that's killing uh, it. We got a good good turnout tonight. Um, okay, so first up, we have a question from Luke. Luke writes in. When you talk about being long a stock, how long is long? Is planning to hold something for 10 to 20 years reasonable? What are the longest holds you've had in your portfolio? You know why that 10-year number, Mike, is is like worth discussing? Why? You just you just shared with me, I don't know if it was yesterday or last week, what percentage of S&P 500 stocks over 10 years underperformed the market? And it's like most, right? Was that was that from you? Well, Who was telling yeah, me about that? Uh, Reckon Thaler just did that. Uh, keep talking. I'll get you that number. Okay. So if you say to yourself, I'm going to hold the stock for 10 years, you should know that the odds are against that stock being better than the S&P 500. Like probabilistically, it's probably not unless you have that much confidence in yourself that you're going to pick the right stock to hold for the long term and you're buying it at the right price. Um, so what 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 Here did that look like for, for most stocks? All right. So over the last... 10 years, which has obviously been a rageable market, compounding at 14% a year, okay? The oh, S&P is giving you 14% a year on average. Yeah, the so they use decade. their Morningstar US stock index. I'm going to guess it's like the Russell 1000, maybe the 3000, I don't Fine. know. Okay. Uh, only 42% of, it, this is shocking, only 42% of individual equities finished in the black. Versus the, versus the market or just were profitable, period? I don't know. I think, I think just profit, just made money okay so 58 percent of stocks were not up over 10 years and the last 10 years were great for the overall market so okay here it is 77 percent of the biggest 1000 companies were positive so they must they must be looking at 3000 stocks but still okay. yeah even even the top thousand stocks so the what big could stocks, account for that is that like mostly oil all those little oil stocks finished negative something like that Oil and natural gas. Yeah, I'm it's sure that's bad, I mean, dude. It's bad. But take it back because Best and Bender's original paper. I mean, that might be a bit more extreme. But anyway, the the point is, most stocks suck ass. <laughs> two out put of three stocks. Put two that out of three, in your refrigerator. <laughs> two out of three stocks underperform the stock market. Two out of three stocks underperform over any ten year period. That's the going, takeaway. Going back to like the 1980s, two out of three underperformed the index. Okay, so now if you say I'm a long-term investor and I think that this stock will outperform over the last 10 years, you have a one in three shot of being right historically. I don't know how much that number varies from one rolling 10-year period to the next, but the like it's it's not terrible odds. It's probably worth a gamble if you're like willing to do the research and say I'm long-term. But I would imagine on shorter time periods, seven years, five years, three years, it gets even harder. So here, here's one of my favorite stats. I wrote about this today from, from JP Morgan's The Agony and the Ecstasy. 40% of all Russell 3,000, I think 3,000 stocks have a catastrophic decline which they from which they never recover, meaning they fall at least 70% or more and never recover. 40% of all stocks. So you really want to concentrate on buying the other 60%. Yeah, like that would be my that would be my strategy. That that's the takeaway from me as well. All right, let's go next. 
Okay, so uh, next up, Adam writes, this is a long one, so bear with me. I frequently encounter people who uh, are about my age who discover three times leveraged ETFs and use them as a core holding. They I know discover that these them. things should not be held long term because they're subject to volatility decay and they can get absolutely slaughtered in drawdowns. But when mm. I highlight these risks, the attitude seems to be meh, no risk, no reward, because they figure it's three times to the downside, but also three times to the upside, and over a long enough period of time it washes out. Is there an easier way to explain why leveraged ETFs are a bad core holding that doesn't involve using esoteric terms like volatility, decay, and are easy to dismiss with a scared money don't make money uh, gif? <laughs> well, for, first, don't, wor don't worry about these idiots. Let them learn for themselves. But second, just explain that in a flat market, sir, every day they're paying a VIG. I believe this is my question. All right, sorry. So, <laughs> actually, your answer will be better than mine. I was about to lose my shit. <laughs> All right. He, so here's what you tell them. Uh, from February 26th, when the market topped, to March 23rd, when the market bottomed, this lost 77%. What how, how would uh, the three-time S&P bull? 77% okay. in like 21 days. Good luck staying with that. But here's 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 the like the de the decay answer. Volatility is a tax on your returns. B what I mean by that is, if you make five percent, you lose five percent. You're not even. You're down a little bit. So you make five percent, lose five percent on these magnified gains. If you do that for sixty days straight, you're down eight percent. The so seventy two. The seventy two percent drawdown example. How much does it take to get back to even? Seventy seven. So, wait, 77. So if you lose 77%, it's not 77% to get back to even. It's much more than that. You have to, you need you to, have to quadruple your money. So you have to make you have to make 335% uh, to get back to even, which they did. But who who needs that? Who needs to lose 77% <laughs> in three days? What are you, out of your mind? Yeah, I, I, I don't understand why these are allowed to be traded and there is no Bitcoin ETF, to your earlier point. Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin's volatile. Bitcoin! 77 percent in 19 days it should right it, it really other than an options trade like that should not exist in an in a vehicle with a ticker symbol for unsophisticated people to like walk into that manhole without a cover what do you think the uh, assets in this thing are i'm sure it's tiny but what do i know how much is 2. it 2.3 billion right but those aren't assets in it those come in and out every day yeah they're in it they're you'd be dude they're in it they're in it it's a great way to uh, generate tax losses if you need them. Um, all right, are we doing any more? Yeah. So uh, I just so hold on. I just want to say. I just want to say one thing. So I was just looking at SPXS, the bear, the mm. bear one. Assets into that spiked. I bet you can guess one. March of 2020. Oh, you're a genius. <laughs> I mean, this, well, chart is, this, chart is, this chart is disgusting. No, 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 no. It's no. The assets came in after the fact. Oh, af well, not during. I guess it was so it was over so fast. Yeah, I hope, hope you tr listen. Don't worry what your friends do. They they are only they're not going to learn from anything you say to them. They're only going to learn from their own losses. That's life. Uh, tell them to watch this though. Tell them to watch our show. They'll 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 get smarter. All right, what else are we doing, Duncan? Yeah, so uh, tonight we're going to take some some questions. Spend a few minutes taking some questions from the the chat. We always get some good questions in there. And uh, so tonight we're gonna we're gonna take a look at those. So so uh, if you're watching, and you have a good question, uh, drop it <laughs> drop it into the <laughs> drop it into the chat. Uh, Did we have so any? First up, yeah. First up, I got this one. I might drop off picture wise just to make room for these. But oh, okay, no, it, it did it. Okay. Oh my cool. god. <laughs> oh, this is a good question. Uh, this Italian guy wants to know where the spaghetti western uh, Star Wars posters are from. Um, these are from an artist named Tim Anderson. These are actually numbered and signed. I'm not sure if they're still for sale, but he's done this really great mashup of some of my favorite Western movies mixed with Star Wars, which I love. So did you get those? A whole set. Did, you, got, did you get them for yourself? Yeah, I got them like 10 years ago. I got, you can't, it's out of focus, but Returno Dello Jedi is a uh, Il Returno Dello Jedi is the other one. So I don't have an Italian accent, but. Uh, Highly recommend if you could find them, buy them because they are sweet. Okay, what else? Oh wow, he's got he's got a he's got a nice website. Uh, okay, uh, his and shit is his shit is incredible. TimothyAndersonDesign.com. Like when... Yeah, he's doing a lot of he's doing a lot of um, Mandalorian stuff now for obvious reasons. Uh, but all of his stuff is so beautiful. Okay, what else? So then uh, we have one about a healthy correction. I guess always not in healthy. NASDAQ, but yeah. 
uh, it never feels healthy while it's taking place. It always feels healthy after it, we've recovered from it, and it always sounds healthy before it happens. No, it's and wild. Pe- people are ready for it. So uh, the high beta names that we were talking about earlier that are down 50% in most cases, dude, the S&P is 2% off its highs. That's crazy because the bank stocks are and, and uh, energy stocks are just bailing out the averages or energy stocks are too small. XLI names, uh, industrials are holding up, Industri- right? Industrials are small too, but so here's my question to you. Mm. If the market does have this healthy correction, 10 to 15%, what happens to these names? Do they, do they go down even more than the market? Is it just a beta of one? Do they go down less because they already got flushed? I might sound like an idiot. I don't think 15% is possible with the amount of money that they're throwing at the markets right now. Like, I don't even think it's, I don't think it's possible that we can have a 15% correction right this minute. Yeah, I'll I think let, we can I'll have let, one I'll, later I'll, this year. I'll let you walk that back. What are you talking about? I'm not walking it back. Walk it back. I honestly think the Fed is like managing. Uh, I honestly think the Dude, Fed is stop. managing to the, to the not, 200 day moving average. They're not that what, powerful. What, per, what percent above the 200 day moving average, it, not the NASDAQ, is the S&P 500 right now? I don't know, a lot. Between five and ten, we're not yeah, that yeah. much more extended than that. So, what's your point, dude? The, what the, I think if we get anywhere within reach of the two hundred uh, of the two hundred day, then what? Then the Fed is coming back out and saying uh, we have no plans whatsoever to taper in two thousand twenty one. This whole thing is being held up by the stock market. I I, I really don't I really don't think that a fifteen percent correction is likely. Unless we find out about a strain that kills you immediately or something like that. Like, I, I don't know. Just my opinion. I, okay. I'm worried about a lot of things. That's not one of the things I'm worried about right now. Hey, what, about, so, uh, what about Square? Do you have any thoughts on, uh, on Square? That's what someone wants to know. Like what? Like buy or sell or hold? We don't do that on the or show. Or just the future right. of the, the company, I think. Square looks great. The stock is going to be huge. It already is huge. What are they, $90 billion? They're going to be huge-er. I did a I did a webinar for a Fortune 500 company, and I met I think the COO of Square. This guy know this guy know has a roadmap, dude. This guy knows what he's doing, and I I probably am mad that I'm not in it, but I own PayPal, and I don't want to own both. Do I own the wrong one? Uh, you might. PayPal you does might. not look great right now. I might own the wrong one. I I own PayPal mostly because of Venmo. But the cash app is also sick, so I don't really, I don't really know that I made the right decision. Uh, all right, what do we got? Hey, let's uh, let's uh, wrap it up on. Oh wait, this. hold on. Last thing, last thing. I was, ta- I was talking to somebody yesterday. They said that Square's customer acquisition cost five bucks, tiny. They're they're crushing Nothing. it. Nothing. Well, you know how they're acquiring customers. If one person sends somebody money to the cash app and that person doesn't have it, they have an incentive to download it because there's cash there waiting for them. It's so right, genius. Well, it's so brilliant. Worst so. sector and best sector to invest in for the next five to 10 years? I mean, I, I don't know. This is a punt for me. Who the hell? I, I have no idea. I, I always say healthcare as an answer to this because it sounds <laughs> obvious. It sounds very obvious that. Oh, I got one. Clean energy. No, nah, I think healthcare is more obvious. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Because, because uh, I think we've just had like a step change in how we approve medications in this country. And the aging population and stuff. So I'm gonna, my Miss America answer to this question is: no, I, I, I got believe a, I got that a, healthcare is the future. I got a best one: uh, consumer discretionary. I'm bullish. I'm bullish on us. Bullish on. I'm bullish on the, the consumer. Money. Yeah, that's that's as good an answer as mine. All right, all right that's so all we got. I'm, I think I'm we're gonna, gonna wrap up here in a second. But yeah, just make sure make sure if you have a question, we didn't get to it. Sorry, there are a lot of questions come in. Just send us uh, your question to ask a compound show at, at gmail.com and we'll try to get to it in a future episode. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm part of me feels like we should research the answers. Um, not the live questions, but the ones that come in. We should do a little bit more work on those prior. I think Speak we were for yourself. I was I was fully I was fully prepared. Oh, uh, I wasn't. All right, I will be next week. Hey, listen, Duncan killed it this week. We appreciate uh, getting us back on track here. Thank you guys for coming. Once again, go ahead and hit that like button for us. We need it like we need oxygen. It's so important. Helps the algorithm determine that this is a show that you actually like, and the algorithm is all powerful. And we know there's a lot of other people talking about stocks and markets and crypto and all these things that are uh good we think that our content is as good if not better so that's how you can agree with us 
hit that like button. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Send this video to your your friends, your coworkers, parents, your, your parents, people that you were in a uh, quarantine pod with all year. Let people know what you're watching. We appreciate ex -boyfriend, it. Ex-boyfriend, right. ex-girlfriend. Ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends. We're going to be back next week. We love you guys. Thanks for all the great questions and topics. And we will talk to you then.